Sometimes in Paris, you really have to go through the passageways that seem rather unsuspecting. Of course, do watch out if it's a private one. For example, just down there, there is a private one. But this one, it's actually something else. There is no, no trespassing sign. No, they actually want you to go inside. But otherwise, most people won't because they might just mistake it for an apartment building. So join me, I'm Ariel, this is Urbanist, and today we're going to explore a little bit of this neighborhood around the Sorbonne University, which I'm super hyped for. It is um, an interesting day. There's a lot of these tiny little rain showers that keep coming on and off. So at any moment's notice, we may be drenched in rain, or a few seconds later, it might be sunny. I tried to go live exactly at 3 p.m., and I was going to be drenched in rain, so I had to seek cover. Let me know where you're watching from. I'm so happy to be exploring Paris once again. A lot of people don't realize Paris has more than 2,000 years of history. Of course, all around Europe, there's history that goes thousands of years. Um, but when it comes to antiquity, a lot of people don't realize that Paris was actually a Roman settlement. It had a different name. It wasn't Paris back then. It was called Lutetia. And let's walk into this building right over here. Nope, this is not just any random Parisian courtyard. No, ladies and gentlemen, this is an actual ancient Roman theater. Yup, right here in the middle of Paris. They actually discovered this as they were transforming Paris in the mid 1800s. Um, they decided not to build apartment buildings behind it. So you kind of see the apartment buildings weren't built fully. So they were kind of cut off right over here. And this was where the ancient Romans sought the, their entertainment back then. Wow, look at this. Ron is watching from the depths, the deepest depths of introspection. That's amazing, Ron. Jenny says, I was back in Paris in August. So much to see and do. There really is a lot to see and do. Uh, let's see if we can get onto the stage. Oh, this is the stage right here. Actually, there is good um, acoustics here as well. And it's very wet and slippery. Hello, Jermaine. Nice to see you here. Welcome. A lot of benches here. So they made it into a proper park, which is nice. There's a playground down there as well. Hey, Anthony says, Bonjour, Ariel. How it's finally reasonable weather here in Jersey City. How is it over here? It's been on and off rain showers and sun, which is very interesting. So I've gotten soaked a few times. <laughs> Luckily not soaked. Soaked is a strong word. I've gotten uh, uh, drizzled upon many times. Seems like they're growing wine, maybe? Or some other type of... They're growing something here. That's new. I've been here, I went here in 2019. So let's get on to the actual seats. So we are about a away from Notre Dame. There's an area right by the University of the Sorbonne. Very famous university. It is an area that people probably will stroll as a tourist, but they might not know about the specific spot. Bernard says, this is actually my last day in New York. Oh, Bernard, enjoy your last day in New York. And here we have all of Bob's friends right over here. Pistol says, do I have Corsican blood? Because a lot of Puerto Ricans do. 
Pistol Dad's right, yeah. There was a huge uh, immigration of Corsicans over to Puerto Rico. Um, not so much. Might have just a little bit because I don't think my families, either on my mom's side or my dad's side, were descended from Corsicans. Uh, though I probably have a lot of extended family that might be descended from Corsicans. Most of my bloodline on the European side comes from the Canary Islands. And as I mentioned before, potentially a bit of that is actually Irish or um, Celtic blood, which is Irish or, or Scotland. But you know else, you know who else was Corsican? Well, Napoleon Bonaparte. Susie says I have Catalan, yeah. Yeah, Puerto Ricans are truly a mix. So before we continue on the Sorbonne, I got a little treat. A treat from Les Maisons d'Isabel. I actually tried this before on a live video. Check that out. Back when I was in Paris a long, long time ago. I remember visiting Paris a long time ago. It was a different time back then, you know. Paris has changed. Wow, how things, you know, how things kind of transform over the months. It's been since June 2022, I've been to Paris. Wow. Ray uh, K says Corsica is one of my final stops on the cruise. Oh, that's so cool. Look at this. Look at this beauty. This is a croissant. And it's one of the better croissants I've tried in Paris. Oh, look at that. Croissant actually meant to look like a star crescent initially. And Susie says, did you originally plan to end with Paris? It was always a part of the plan, Susie ever since day one. Yeah, quite literally. It's a lot cheaper to uh, do a round trip flight from one city. If you try to do a flight to one city from the US and then fly out from another city in Europe back to the US, it'll actually cost you a lot more. So pro tip, either book a round trip from the same city or this is another pro tip, book your round trip from the same city. However, if you're using Delta, you can change your flight, modify it, and change it from a different city, and they won't charge you that much more, if at all. So when I did that last year, my round trip was from Greece, Athens, but I changed it over to fly out from first Rome and then Milan, and uh, I didn't get charged extra. I actually got returned some money because the flights were cheaper from their own policy. So pro tip, use Delta. I really like them because you can easily change flights. So let's try out this croissant. Let's see how it is. Before we continue walking around La Sorbonne. Mm. Wow. Imagine being an ancient Roman or probably from one of the recently adapted French Gauls or Gauls back then that were integrated into Roman society. Imagine being one of them and eating a croissant. As you see, classic Greek plays updated into the Roman format. They probably didn't have croissants. They didn't at all, but you could just imagine. <laughs> These kids are playing some game. This is a great croissant. Super soft, super fluffy. Look at that. Very airy. Uh, the, the butter is just delicious. It just, mmm. It's amazing. Susie says, well, you keep on speaking French when you're back in New York. Yes, I'm going to be one of those very annoying American tourists that go back to the States. And someone says, 
Hey, Ariel, um, uh, let's go out for coffee. Yeah, yeah, let's go grab some cold brew coffee and uh, some croissants. Cro uh, croissants. <laughs> I'll be like, no, no, no. It's croissant. Okay. We're going to grab some, not cold brew, café allongé and croissants. <laughs> Just like I did when coming back from Italy. They were like, hey, let's go to an Italian-American restaurant. Let's have some um, bruschetta. No, no, it's bruschetta, okay? <laughs> no, I actually don't do that. I'm joking around. <laughs> I might do that with Spanish words, if, if, since I'm Puerto Rican, but I usually don't do that with any other language. I wonder what these kids are doing. Mika says, I envy you and your croissants. This is an amazing croissant. And they got beer at the end of it cool thing is you can drink publicly in France. French urbanists, let me know what they're playing. There's beer at the end of this track that they made. And it seems like it's about team building. Chris says they're having fun. Yeah, it's the beauty of of Paris. Is outside. <laughs> it allows people to be more relaxed. I I, I like it. You know, um, it is a reality that a lot of people suffer from alcohol addiction. It's very very sad, and I'm glad when not just institutions but also governments help those people. But I think as we are involving as a society. I think some places are ready to allow people to drink while outside. It doesn't, it's not about encouraging alcohol consumption, but just the people who want to, just let them do as they please. And that's why I advocate for allowing alcohol in the streets of New York. Hopefully they'll allow at some point. All right, let's continue walking around. This is amazing. Is this Paris or another French city, Adam? No, we're in Paris. We're not in a French city. We're back to Paris. This is our final stop on this grand tour of Europe 2022. Let's explore La Sorbonne. See what the university is about and other sites near it. These are ancient Roman ruins, ladies and gentlemen. J.A. says, today came back on Paris. Yeah, we're doing Paris once again. Ooh, seats. Let's take a few. It's called Arenas, Arenas de Luteche, Arenas of Luteche. Adam says, what ruins were these? The arenas of Luteche. The ancient Roman arena. Mark says, are you taking a break from travel when you go home to New York? Mark, yeah. Uh, I don't think I'll be traveling for at least one month. Um, I'm not sure if I'll be traveling more. Oh, cool. Paris Jazz Corner. Oh, that's awesome. Jenny says the queen is not doing well. I hope you're most likely referring to the queen of England. Angela says, have you heard about the queen? No about these things. 
cool old jazz albums. Look at that. Tyler says, I'm going to head off now. Just wanted to say a quick hello. Hey. Oh, no. Bad service here. Let me know if you see me and hear me. I think uh, there's a bit of uh, bad service here. Cell phone reception. Dawn says, I'm glad to see you back in Paris. I'll be there in a month, in October. Oh, that's good that you're doing Paris for a month. It's definitely a city that you can easily spend a month or more here as a tourist. Of course, there's a beautiful city, I think, to live in as well. I think those are the walls of the Sorbonne. Let's check it out. Tunita says, uh, signal's breaking up a little bit. Yeah, unfortunately. Unfortunately, I'm not sure what's happening. Beautiful building. Look at this. Katrina says, was wondering if you're covering the Thanksgiving Day Parade. Probably not. I spent Thanksgiving with family. Uh, so, no, unfortunately, I don't think so. But I would recommend my friend New York City for all. She covers the Thanksgiving Day Parade. Um, New York City walking show as well. There's many, many live streamers. But those two specifically cover the parade. Cool shops here. Here's a shop about a bookstore. Hey, Jamie says, I want to go to Paris, but my wife is afraid people don't like Americans. How do they treat Americans? <laughs> uh, Jamie, great question. Let me, um, I gotta finish off this croissant. It's a bit hard to kind of hold this and keep walking. Laura says, are these um, residential areas mixed with commercial areas? So in the U.S., we're very used to, unless if you are in the older cities of Boston, Manhattan, I mean, New York specifically, Washington, D.C., Philly, a bit of Chicago, you're probably used to seeing things very separate. Commercial, separated from residential, separated from industrial, separated from... Uh, anything in between like manufacturing or creative design or offices here in Paris and basically every city in Europe has mixed-use buildings so a lot of the first floors are businesses generally there are uh, businesses for food for groceries for shops and sometimes there are offices and then all the upper floors are or residential. So even a gorgeous building like this with this gorgeous fountain right in the corner, that is all residential here. All right, let me, let me uh, enjoy the rest of this croissant. So uh, we have an excellent question about, do the French like Americans? How do they treat Americans? Uh, so as I'm eating this croissant, I'm going to answer that. It's a bit hectic. There's a lot of stuff going on. So pardon me for being a bit distracted. And this busy, this city is nowhere near as busy as New York. 
you know, New York is where you feel really high energy. So, you know, um, I would say if you're watching TV, you might see the worst examples of, of the French, how they act to the Americans. Uh, or foreigners in general, but specifically Americans, you might see the worst of it, especially fictionalized. Uh, and then maybe there's some documentaries as well, as well. But and then books sometimes emphasize on the awkwardness of interacting with the French. It is possible that you might meet a French person or two that very audibly does not like Americans. And I've encountered that. One reason you might encounter that more here than, say, in the U.S. Uh, or other countries of people audibly not liking uh, a specific culture is because here there's a, uh, it's a bit more straightforward than even New York. There's a bit more uh, kind of um, less of a filter when it comes to chatting about other countries. But that is very rare. You rarely encounter that. Many French people, from my own personal experience, and this has been the experience of many other uh, people who explore France, is that the French are actually very kind to Americans. They actually like America, especially New York. They really like New York. They really love it, especially younger French. The, uh, below, I would say, the age of around 40, you end up having people who are very, very uh, kind-hearted to Americans, and sometimes they even have them very intrigued about America. There is the unfortunate uh, thing that there's a lot of stereotypes with Americans that the French themselves perpetuate. Um, but if you don't take it too personally, you'll be fine. <laughs> and you'll never get any reception that's so bad that they, you would not feel safe. You'll never get that. Um, it never goes into aggression. It might be a form of some very strong opinions, but never aggression. So you'll be okay. Tell your wife to not take things too personally. People say stereotypes or they assume something from you. Don't take it personally. Otherwise, you'll be okay. Kay says, I think there's stereotypes in most countries. Yeah, but American stereotypes are pretty strong. Wow, this is a beautiful park.
and that's going to be being American in in France specifically is actually a very good learning experience. It makes you aware of our cultural quirks, which we we tend to have. Like for example, Americans, it's something just normal. We we speak a little bit on a higher volume than many Europeans, specifically the French. This also applies to the Italians. Uh, also applies to the English. Uh, we speak a higher volume. Um, and, you know, Puerto Ricans and other Hispanics like Dominicans we speak even higher volume, I know personally. So it makes you aware of that as well. And, you know, when you are in a different country, I think it's better to just adapt into that country. You don't need to you know, change your entire personality, but I think be willing to adapt to certain cultural norms when you're here for a smoother experience. So if you realize, hey, wait a minute, a lot of people here at the restaurant are staring at me because I'm speaking very loud. You're not being a rude American as some people may say to you. No, you just used to speak at a higher level. So just change it up. Just lower your volume a little bit. Doesn't mean that you're changing yourself. Doesn't mean you're compromising your Americanness. <laughs> it means that you're just you're just being polite to the culture around you. Um, another thing that Americans are unfortunately badly stereotyped for is uh, the very openness, over friendliness. That is not something negative. People may frame it as negative. Certain people. Certain cultural programs might frame as negative here, but it's not negative. You know, it's something very beautiful about America is that we are very friendly, very kind of extroverted society. Um, but you have to be aware that if you're in France and you're kind of just striking up a conversation with a random person, it's people might be a little bit weirded out by your extroversion, your typical American extroversion. So just be aware of that too. And then the third thing is, is the lack of straightforwardness. And this stereotype is shared also with the British. Americans are straightforward in some aspects, but in other aspects, they're not that straightforward. Uh, so people tend to interpret Americans as being quote unquote fake. Of course, it's just how it is in America. We, we're not gonna really tell you straightforward to your face that we don't like you. <laughs> We're going to, you know, hint at it, but we're not going to tell this straight to your face. Uh, it's just the polite thing to do. Also, in politics, we're not going to straight uh, forward tell you our political views because this is not the polite thing to do in America. But here, it's rather normal. So people might think you're being fake. So either you can assimilate to the culture while you're here or kind of avoid that scenario. Just be sure to not... Um, be sure that you're not being misunderstood. Just tell people, hey, I'd rather not talk about this specific topic. And I think that's the way you can ease yourself when coming to a different culture. It's all learning experience. It actually is more fun than, than not. It's a lot of fun. You end up learning a lot about yourself, your culture, and you learn, end up learning about the other cultures that you're visiting as well. Who's this guy? Dolores says, I tend to morph into the culture that I'm visiting. Yeah. And Chris says, at least try to learn a little French. That is the biggest, biggest pro tip. So France is a col uh, culture of politeness, similar to the UK. Um, but politeness here is always acknowledging someone's presence when going into their space. So if it's a store, a restaurant, a, if you're a college kid and coming here for a school, professor, classroom, anything, library, museum, bus, a train, if you see the conductor, always say bonjour every single time. And say it in French, don't say just hi, say bonjour. You don't need to know that much French, but just make sure you know the hello and goodbye, bonjour. And thank you. Merci. Merci beaucoup. K. 
Key says, I prefer to be straightforward. Like me, yeah, but you have to realize that not every culture is good like that. <laughs> okay. It's a beautiful thing about Irish culture is it is indeed rather straightforward. This is a beautiful university area. Wow. Let's continue exploring. So I think we should I think we should be right now in the grounds of the Sorbonne. Jay just uh, says, carry the entire conversation with bonjour, bonjour, bonjour. <laughs> the more sing-songy you say bonjour, the more friendly the reception. So rather than just saying bonjour or bonjour, no, no, no. You gotta say bonjour. The more sing-songy you get, the warmer the person is going to be towards you. So if you want the warmest reception of a pr French person, so make sure to make an entire song out of bonjour. Bonjour. And boom, they'll open up before your eyes. Also, we're in the area of the Museum of Natural History. We're in the uh, Jardin de Plantis. Stephanie says, that's why I love Ireland and Irish people, yeah. Yeah, that's a different culture as well. You, have to, you also have to have a thicker skin as an American because the Irish like to joke around a lot. And you really have to have a thick skin for humor. So in French, you have to have a thick skin for bluntness. But in Ireland, you have to have a thick skin for what is called slagging. So we see a lot of college kids because we're adjacent to the Sorbonne. Nicole says, I live 10 minutes away from the, from the French border. I'll try <laughs> the bonjour <laughs> next time. I hope, I wish you luck. And then um, the French like to wish everyone good meal, Bon appetit, good, voy uh, good travels, good voyage would be bon voyage. Uh, good travels, if you're a tourist and they know you're a tourist, they'll say bon travail, I think is said. Uh, do let me know how to say again, good travels. If it is a Sunday, you'll sometimes hear people say bon dimanche, which means have a good Sunday. You say bon journée, which means have a great day. Or have a good day. Bon soirée, have a good evening. Bonne nuit, have a good night. There's a lot of bons. You can bon everything. There's even in some restaurants, especially the higher end, more hipster restaurants, you'll hear bon gustion, I think it's pronounced, which means have a good digestion, I think it means. <laughs> which is a, like a very fancy way of saying have a good meal. Jay says, this is the French Central Park. I can see that. Here, very classic looking greenhouses. Wendy says, what's avocado toast? Yeah, Wendy, France kind of sucks with avocado toast. I mean, you're not going to, it's not, you're not going to reasonably expect something very American and Australians also, it's part of their culture. Uh, you're not going to obviously expect it here, but um, yeah, it sucks. Yeah, there's not, I have not encountered a good avocado toast in France. England has way better avocado toasts. George says, I enjoy the rest of your live streaming. I'm going back to sleep. <laughs> good night, George. We're at the Jardin. De Plantis. Looking sharp today. You're going somewhere posh later for a meal, says Katrina. Oh, yes. 
very posh meal. <laughs> uh, Katrina, thank you so much. Uh, no, 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 I don't have any specific plans. But you know, this is something I think Americans should learn from the French specifically. And this applies to a few other cultures, French and Italians. Dress your best. Even if you're going out for a mere stroll, even if you're going out for grocery shopping, you'll see this is a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, you'll see, especially women, when they're going out grocery shopping, they put on their makeup, they have a nice dress. This is, of course, not saying that you have to be feminine or you have to wear makeup, but uh, I find it to be a, a rather beautiful thing. And if you end up speaking to French women, and there's a lot of great podcasts out there where they actually interview French women, it's not as seen as something that they must do, which unfortunately in America sometimes is the case, where people, where women feel forced to put on a face of makeup uh, or wear a nice dress or something like that. But they do it out of the sheer pleasure of doing so. That has been the um, vibe you see when people are well-dressed. This also applies to men. Well-dressed when they're going out. Uh, even for a mere stroll or going grocery shopping or, or going to a lunch. Where in, in America now it's acceptable to wear your sweatpants to lunch. And if you're a woman or dress femininely, yoga pants. It's just now acceptable. Uh, you'll be shocked at the casual dress nowadays for lunch in New York City. Uh, and that's why I think France does it well. So I would say dress your best. It is nice to dress well. You feel good. It is a, there's something good that feels about it. Um, it's not about vanity. It just feels nice. It's like dressing up a garden. You can leave the garden grow wild. Yeah, sure, you can leave it grow wild. Let the grass grow long, let the flowers grow wherever they please, let the weeds grow in. You can do that with the garden, sure. And that, in, in a way, has its beauty. You can go to a meadow and see the wild meadow. It has its beauty. But us humans, we love to curate. We love to beautify. So if we beautify a garden, why not beautify the way we dress from time to time? It's so wonderful. So I, rec I recommend it. Try it out. Try the French way. Go out to the grocery store and dress your best. Sergio says, has anyone ever said hi to you? Um, since you've been filming. And I believe what you're talking about is spandex. No, spandex is a different thing from yoga pants. I don't think it's made. I don't think yoga pants are typically made from spandex. Though there might be spandex uh, gym wear. Yeah, but I'm not 100% sure. Companies like Lululemon make the type of dress that now people are just using casually for a lunch and sometimes even a dinner. Uh, San Blops says, uh, five pounds, have a pint on, on me. Oh, thank you so much, San Blops. I appreciate that. Maybe I will have a pint. I think that would be awesome. Carla says, very beautiful, yeah. I do have trouble with my frizzy hair, so I end up putting in the ponytail, says Susie. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if we're going to see it today. Look at these two women. I think this, this is a perfect example. These two women are, seem to just be going on a stroll. I don't think they're doing work or anything. And look how well dressed they are. Look how they made up their hair. That's a good example. And this applies to all ages. So you can see this in this example, uh, women who are, appear to maybe be a, a more than 65, at least one of them. See right here also with gentlemen or a nice like shirt jacket. 
M Wall says, where's your tie? <laughs> oh no, M Wall, I would never wear a tie. I, I do not like ties. I really don't like ties. I have not gotten accustomed to them yet. Oh my God, Urbanist Orange Flowers. Wow, these are so cool. Alman Votaro says the same thing in Italy happens where we wish good for everything. Yes. Yeah. Gorgeous flowers. If anyone can let me know the name. Wow. Beautiful. Beautiful shade of orange. Blueberries says, live long and prosper. Oh, thank you so much. Ooh, statues. I find that Parisians don't dress to impress. They dress for themselves. Ah, yes. Um, yeah. Well, Chris. I was saying that as a matter of just speaking. But yeah, you're right. You're right. To be more specific, you're right. It's not really the, the intention is not so much dress to impress, but dressing for yourself. Yeah. Susie says, take one and press it. Susie, are you asking me to pick a flower, kill it, press it, zombify that flower, and put it into a book? That sounds rather barbaric. <laughs> Who's this guy? Oh, this is Schroeder. Schroeder. Oh, wow. Wait, is this Schrodinger? No. No, this is Schroeder. Science of Mystery. Schroeder. 1890, man, yeah, marble. He sounds very familiar. I think I learned about him in chemistry. Mika says, I have to go to work. Maybe see you tomorrow. Hey, Mika. Yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed the live stream. Thank you so much for tuning in. SPL says, yoga pants called leggings these days as well. Include Lycra, which is the same as Spandex. Uh, Spandex is the generic name. Lycra is the brand name. Okay, thank you. Cool Daddy says, what you learned about chemistry, about Schroeder, I can't remember. I just remember learning about Schroeder uh, when I studied engineering in college. Chris says, are you getting some Capri pants? You know, Capri pants are very popular in America. You know, for some reason, Capri pants look good in the south of Italy. They don't look so good when going shopping to Target. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure why. Just Capri pants don't fit so much in America. It's like wearing a Panama hat in the middle of Bushwick. It just, it just doesn't fit. Cool Daddy says, what did you have for lunch? A scone with jam and clotted cream. 
because I'm missing England. I went to Shakespeare and Company. Check out my Instagram stories. I have a full story that talks about my entire experience of eating scones, cream tea in Paris. Sergio says, thank you so much for mentioning me, uh, mentioning me, I made my day. Being that I have cousins in Puerto Rico, you're a good example of a gentleman in maintaining the prestige of individuals. Uh, a shout out to all the Latino individuals or people who consider themselves with Latino heritage. Now, if you can get into a conversation with someone there as polite as you, hopefully they know the same English. Who knows? Maybe bilingual, Spanish, English, and French. Yeah, uh, Sergio, thank you so much for watching the show. Appreciate the compliment. I have, um, there's plenty of Latin Americans in Paris. I collaborate with an uh, amazing creator by the name of Daniela. I think it was her name, Daniela. Uh, her last name is escaping me, but we did a few short TikTok videos together, Facebook Reels. That was really cool. I bought this new bracelet at a place called Designs by Andes. It's all made by Latin Americans based in Paris, uh, which is really cool. So this is a Latin American design chain bracelet. Tunita, send a thousand, 110 stars. Thank you so much, Tunita. I appreciate that. Merci beaucoup. Katrina, it's a smart bracelet. Ooh, thank you. This is a nice saunter. Sandsblob says, uh, Sans Blob says uh, the Sorbon area is great. I love going to the nearby park as well. Mwall. Mwall says, from Mwall on the run for Thai fun. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't see too much the appeal of Thais aesthetically. I'd rather wear an ascot than a Thai. That's a cool old style merry-go-round. That's amazing. Uh, cool Daddy says, is there rare good books in the Sorbonne? Please, um, please make a video on it too. You know, getting access to universities is a bit tough. I would have to know someone in the university. Um, and they sometimes take a little while to even start reaching out to people. So no, I won't be able to go inside the Sorbonne. Uh, I'm sure they have a library with some very old or rare manuscripts, I'm sure that they have it. M. Wall on the Run says, I approve the Escada. <laughs> Thank you. I wore a tie for my interview on a political protest here on YouTube, says Renee. Oh, wow, Renee. Fancy. Nova says, I'm supposed to be doing my laundry. I knew turning on this live was dangerous. Oh, yes, this is highly addictive content. <laughs> you have to watch out when uh, tuning on to Urbanist. You may not get any work done. Tamara says, get an Escot smoking jacket and velvet slippers. That'll be Tamara when I enter my, <laughs> my, my uh, retired phase. When I retire many, 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 many decades from now.
off all the money I made from being a, a sponsor for a sparkling water company. Hey, Renee, send the super chat. Hey, Renee, thank you so much for the super chat. Renee says the cool kids call it simmer. Simar. I'm not sure what simar is. Are. Thank you so much, Renee. Wendy says in the pipe too. Yeah. When the uh, sunset says, uh, visit the Normandy beaches. I heard great stuff about Normandy. And Breton as well. Cue the Jurassic Park music. Dun, 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 dun. Cool Daddy says, how much do you spend on average per destination? That's a good question, uh, Cool Daddy. So one thing you must know is I don't travel on a strict budget. Um, I've never really been a fan of traveling on a budget. So that's one thing you should know. Because you're, when a uh, YouTuber cover uh, the topic of how much they spend while traveling, a lot of them really are on a budget. They go to hostels. Uh, they don't eat out too much. Um, they're not spending much money on transportation. A lot of things. Uh, so for me, I like staying in a good centrally located place. Um, I'd rather spend more money on lodging than suffering <laughs> with no like air conditioner or suffering uh, hearing the snoring of a random stranger in a shared hostel. I don't want to do that. Uh, so I spend about 1,500 euro on average, maybe for a two week trip. Sometimes it could be less, it depends on the city. As low as 600 euro for two weeks, as high as 3,000 euro for two weeks. So that's lodging. And then transportation, I usually get a limited pass, which will cost me anywhere between 10 euro to 50 euro. So again, it depends on the city to 10 to 50 euro for two weeks of transportation, which is really good. Uh, and I do a lot of public transportation. If I do day trips, each of them may be maximum 100 euro, maximum. Uh, so whenever I cover a new city and I'm still based on another city, if it's a bit farther away, then you might assume I'm spending about 100 euro for train tickets. Uh, that's not the case in Nice because those, all those cities are basically commuting to other like it's just very nearby. But that's the case, for example, in um, here in Paris when I did Mont Saint Michel. I went very, very far. And then beyond that, um, food. Food I spent quite a bit. It depends on where I'm at. In Denmark, I could not spend too much on food because it was way too expensive, so I had to cook at home. Um, there's an upper limit of how much I would spend for food because I don't justify 
40, I don't, I don't justify $22 for a sandwich. I can't justify it. There's no way I can justify it. So generally I go out to eat and that could be about 60 euro per day. It's a lot. Yeah, I spend a lot, sometimes more. I spend a lot on food. I, I enjoy it, deeply enjoy it. So yeah, it could be anywhere from, for two weeks it could be anywhere from 1,000 euro to 4,000 euro. I would say it's probably the average for two weeks. Which actually sounds a lot. <laughs> yeah, traveling, traveling can get expensive, but there are, that's the way, I travel very comfortably. So I'm almost traveling like a person would if they had, if they were a millionaire. I just, I'm obviously not spending that much. But I'm traveling as comfortably as someone who would if they were a millionaire. Um, so uh, 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 the only difference is I'm not taking like taxis all the time. Unless if I'm in a country like Mexico where taxis are super cheap. Yeah, I don't like answering this question. It's too complicated. Uh, the range is so varied. I don't, I don't like keeping track of the numbers either. Uh, I look at my bank account. If, I, if I'm running out of money, then the trip has to stop. <laughs> I don't do any trips on debt. No trips on debt. That's one, my number one policy. If I don't have money, I won't do a trip. I won't do a trip. I'll just go back to New York City. No trips on debt. I've have accumulated zero debt in my entire career. Zero debt, I have no debt whatsoever. Uh, that's my number one policy. So if I'm going to a negative, I will never get to a negative because I would just stop traveling and go back. Uh, that's why I don't really look at my bank account. I just look if I'm, I just see my bank account to see if I'm not overspending, unreasonably so, which I generally don't have that issue. But in some cities like Copenhagen and Denmark, you can find yourself overspending. Uh, the UK as well. Paris, not here, because generally food here is a good price. Italy, food is an excellent price. So yeah, I hope, I hope that helps. This is more of a wild, chaotic way of explaining my, my spending habits. Michelle says, three months in the UK, we will love it. That's where things get expensive. I spend quite a lot in Ireland and the UK for those month trips. Here's the beautiful McDonald's. Oleg says, life can be short, indulge yourself. Yes, I think that's very important. Let me see which way to go. Where would it be compelling to walk to? I kind of like this look of the street. And this, let's check out the map. Let's see. Usually on the trains, we have a map. Chris says, when you're at home, you also have expenses. Yeah. That's the good thing about traveling. If your business is traveling, which mine is, it's, it's, a, it's a smart business move to keep on traveling. That's. That's, uh, that's the privilege of being a content creator. This applies to like writers. If you're, if you're a writer about travels, yeah, you should keep on traveling. The woman who wrote Eat, Pray, Love. Do you think she, do you think Elizabeth Gilbert fussed a few months after once she got paid for the book? She actually got paid for the book before she started traveling, as if I recall correctly. So she had like a advance. Do you think she fussed about traveling for, was it six months? Uh, across three very different countries? No, because that's her business. So if your business is travel, then travel. Hey, do you keep all your receipts for tax purposes? Yeah, Chris, I have a huge stack of receipts, massive. I keep every receipt, meticulously. So we are right here. The Gare de Australitz. Gare de Astralitz, the hospital is right below us. No, yeah, this is the, the medical school as well. Um, yeah, I want to go this way. I think, yeah, this way. That would be cool. Cool. 
cool. Now I know where we're at. And this is the five and the C. Nice. And can we catch the 10? We can catch the 10. Ooh. I want to see the mosque. Where's the mosque? Wendy says, don't go to back to New York City. <laughs> Someone asked me about tax. Generally, if your business is in travel, a lot of those travel expenses are expenses when you're doing your taxes. If you are a content creator and you have a tax person who's telling you otherwise, then they don't know sufficiently enough about the business of making travel content. And this applies to a lot of other people. If you need to spend money on a meal to show it on a video, that is a tax expense because that is work. If you have to um, you take an Uber to get to a specific place so I can also shoot a video or take a cable car to get top of a mountain, that is a tax expense because obviously that was work. The video, that content is directly related to how I make an income. But this, that's very specific to what I do and this applies to travel vloggers, uh, travel writers, documentary filmmakers, Instagrammers, photographers, journalists. It's probably, there's a wide range of people who travel for a living. Um, people who handle international business as well. Wendy says, are your, tax, are your socks a tax expense? That's a bit harder uh, to justify. We have to really extensively talk about my socks. Maybe a, tr a beauty vlogger or a fashion vlogger might, you know, that is their work if they're talking about socks. <laughs> that, my work is not talking about socks. Shirts, yeah. Uh, there's a thing about uniforms. So if you wear a uniform for your, vid uh, for your content or your work or anything that you do, um, that is a tax expense. So for example, ABBA, one of the reasons ABBA even started wearing fancy costumes was because they found out that they can tax expense those fancy costumes and they can uh, expense it as a wardrobe for their performances, which is exactly what they did. ABBA did a lot of cool things with taxes, actually. There's actually probably a very good article, at the very least, about ABBA's taxes. Very interesting band. They were very financially smart. John says, how about an endorsement deal for socks? <laughs> you know, if that happened, then maybe that, that would be a different case. Teresa says is right, a performer could write off stage calls. Yeah? Michelle says we should make an ABBA tribute. I did have a full video about the ABBA Museum available to patrons. Sergio says, your honesty is totally inspiring. As a single, I do spend some money on excellent restaurants. 
Uh, for example, the ones located inside Macy's. Oh, I'm so glad. So glad you're enjoying the videos. This is a cool train path over here. I don't know what line this is specifically, but it shows a really cool perspective of the city. Andrew says they caught Capone with tax evasion. Yeah, because Capone evaded taxes. Yeah, don't do that, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, is Andrew still, still using the same pair? Yeah. The pair of Converse's I am wearing are the ones from England. I bought them in England. So, two months and a half. More. Actually, almost three months. Yeah, three months. I've been wearing these same, same pairs. Would they need to be replaced, Alexander? I think they will. My, the pad on the Converse's gave out about a month and a half ago. So in Rotterdam, I had to buy um, foot pads you know, to make my shoes comfortable again. So yeah, Converse's don't last too long. Wow, beautiful apartment building. Really well maintained, look at that. Case says, and they're still white, oh yes. I've become an expert in keeping white shoes white. Despite all the dog poo, the rain, the snow, the hail, chewing gum. All these challenges. And the shoes are still white. Ron says, have you worn those for three months, never taking them off? No, no. I also have boots that I wore for hiking. Kimberly says, give us your tips for not uh, ruining your shoes. Well, number one, don't step on poo. That's tip number one. It's one of the most important pieces of life advice you ever hear in your life. Step number two, don't step into puddles. Nope, nope, that puddle ain't gonna be stepped on. Uh-oh, we have puddles over here. Do I, no, I do not step on them. And there we go, that's step number two. Step number three, you wash them. <laughs> I wash these pair at least once. Uh, so you just put them in the washer, uh, very low temperature or cold, um, not too much soap. Make sure you put some towel or some type of bag so they won't you know, cause too much noise or ruin your washing machine. And there you can wash your shoes. It'll decrease the lifespan of your shoes, so if you absolutely must wash them, then do. Renee says, I made a mistake of stepping on poo. Oh no, Renee, that sucks. Wow, cool painting. Cool, right?
So about 100 years ago, there was a man who was not French from outside of France, who he was um, nobility, I think, from England, and somehow stayed here in France. He had a complicated bloodline, uh, but he loved Paris nonetheless. But he saw Paris being consumed with cholera and terrible diseases and terrible drinking water that was just foul to smell as he passed by a well. So he decided to put in his own money to beautify the city of Paris with all these wonderful fountains. And uh, at first he wanted to paint them in other colors, and there's a few of these that are painted in red and yellow. Uh, he preferred other colors, but he decided to compromise and make them into a beautiful sage green, dark forest green, in order to match the benches that are all around this city. So here we have the Wallace Fountain. Susie says, was he Scottish? Oh, my mistake. Do let me know. He was uh, definitely the UK. Do let me know exactly where he was from in, um, in the UK. And you'll still see these fountains throughout the city. Some of them still work. This one appears to not be working, unless if there's a button, let's see. It says that it's drinkable water. Look at this, right here. Beautiful shade of green too. So I don't see a button, unfortunately. No, no button. So this one's not working, but you'll still see a few of them that do indeed work. Wendy says, not a fan of... Oh, really? I love the green paint. I saw a yellow one. Yellow one does not seem too pleasing. Yellow does not seem appetizing. I would not want to drink water from a yellow fountain. Red kind of looks cool, though. I would like blue. Blue would be nice. There is water dripping, so there is some... This is still connected to the water pipe. Just, I don't know how to turn it on. Susie says, help yourself, bring one as a souvenir. Yeah. I hope no one has tried stealing them, but they'll be very hard to steal. Oh, beautiful. Nice to see them. And you know, you would think Paris does not have too much modern architecture, but it does. Look at these condo buildings right here. As you can see, the fountain actually matches a lot of the fences that are all around Paris too. It used to have a mug attached to it years ago, but it was removed for hygiene reasons. Oh, Edjo, that's, that's cool to hear about. Oh, look at this. Wow, beautiful new condo. This is what New York City lacks, um, that Paris and other cities like Mexico City do better. There's condos that somehow feel integrated into the cityscape. They don't stick out like a sore thumb, as sometimes you see in New York. And then B, they have patios, uh, which is amazing. Uh, balconies, which you don't see in New York City too much, sometimes, but not too much. Uh, that. And they're beautifully maintained too. So here you actually have some concrete. Oh, it seems like this is an architecture firm. Right here, look at that. Maybe this is like their showpiece. Ron asks, have you narrowed down the houses you have been choosing for 60 years? <laughs> this is my uh, six year long apartment hunting series. John says, most New York City architecture is terrible. I, I, you know, John, I would disagree with you there. <laughs> but yeah, modern architecture is a bit boring in New York and many other parts of the U.S. 
the very, very modern things that were built in the past like 20, 30 years. So it's a bit, it tend to be a bit boring. Unless if they're super expensive and meant for people who can afford a $10 million apartment. Certain tenants in my building have um, terraces, yeah. I can't say the word terrace too much because I talked about a balcony, I'll use that word, in Nice, posted it on TikTok, and TikTok marked it as sensitive content and they blocked it off. So people can watch it, but they have to click uh, to agree to see content that might be sensitive, uh, which is very unfortunate. It was just the Airbnb tour. And it's because I use that T word that's under, it's very similar to another T word. Oh, here's another Wallace Fountain. And this one's running, actually. Oh, you're, not so, you're supposed to give me away? That's bad. This one's actually running. But it has a lot of residue on it. And when I drink from that water fountain, it has a spider web. Let me know, would you drink from this water fountain? Well, it appears to either be fungus or accumulation of pollen, or maybe both. Maybe rust as well. We see some rust, we see some spider webs. We see dust, the accumulation of particulates from all the gas guzzling cars. Will you drink from this fountain? <laughs> Alpha says no. Chris says, yeah, I would fill up my water bottle. Wendy says, sparkling water? No. Oh, no sparkling water. Okay, he says no, Ron says not even for one million euro. I mean one million euro. That, I think I would take a sip for one million. Just one sip. As Phil says, terrace is sensitive comment. Yes, it is because it sounds very similar to another T word. A person who commits violence, mostly for a political or religious act. That's the other T word. Hot cards. Carla says it would definitely increase your immune system. Oh yeah. Hey, Jeannie. GN. Nice to see you here, GN. Bienvenue to Paris. Well, let's check out what this is. I'm now truly lost in Paris. Oh, this is just a apartment block. Well, it appears to be an abandoned apartment block. All right, let's stay away from that. Carlos says, what a lovely balcony. Oh, yeah. So Ron says, apparently even mentioning the Toyota, um, a specific make of the Toyota can get you into trouble. Yes, yes. You can't mention the Toyota. You can't mention balconies 
We can talk about World War II history. You can't be a sex educator. No. Le Cantine de Somme. These look rather delectable. 100% healthy. Ooh, we got Les Bows. We got Quinoa Bowl. Les Sandwich, we got a falafel sandwich. Oh, well, that's awesome. So a lot of restaurants close during the day. Here's what you would see a lot. Um, Chinese tratir. Tratir. A lot of them. All around Paris. I'm not sure if they're that good. I only remember trying one and I did not like it. Do they have like pork buns? I think they do. Paris is a gorgeous city to get lost in. So I would recommend just wandering around. No Google Maps, no directions. Just wander. I did that two days ago. I went to La Marais, wandered around that beautiful neighborhood, found so many cool shops, so many cool things to do. Highly recommend it. Now we're at a big boulevard. Which boulevard is this? got buses here. Oh, here are buses right there in the middle. Susie says gotta go. Thank you so much for tuning in Susie. Let's go to the shady side. There's a lot of scooters and bicycles all around here in beautiful Paris that you can rent. A lot of them are Lime. There's a few other companies too. Oh, I got to update the weather. Sorry about that, everyone. The weather's still showing from Nice. It's pretty chilly. It's about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. I got mute. Be right back. I'm back. I have no idea where I'm at anymore. When you're lost like this, obviously, you know, I have a phone and we're in Paris. 
there's buses and trains, stations everywhere, so you'll never get really that lost. But getting this level of lostness, I would say appreciate it because I haven't felt that in New York City in years, especially in Manhattan. I haven't felt that in Manhattan in years, um, probably since I was a teenager. So it's, um, it's a truly beautiful experience to be lost in a city because you'll never feel that again once you start getting to know the city. I will probably never feel that again in Manhattan in my entire life. I will always know where I'm at in Manhattan. Which, yeah, it's a good thing. But also, it was nice. Many years ago, wandering the streets of Manhattan and being like, where the F am I? <laughs> it's a beautiful experience. So enjoy it while you can. Ron says, being lost in rock, oh my God. That huge antenna. Ron says being lost in Rotterdam is it was beautiful. <laughs> this is Boulevard Saint, Mar uh, Saint Marcel. Boulevard Saint Marcel. And we have another garden. Are there bad areas in Paris? Yeah, but there you have to go pretty far to start seeing the bad areas of Paris. Bad areas of Paris, the worst ones are more towards the suburbs. So it's like being lost in Manhattan and then somehow walking all the way to Brownsville. Most people wouldn't get into that position. <laughs> We'd be walking for hours. Uh, so no, no, I don't, think, I don't think we could just randomly bump into a dangerous area in Paris. There's one area that's close to this tourist, touristic center that is a bit rougher around the edges. Um, it's one, one right by a triumphal arch, but not the main Arc de Triomphe. I, for, I don't know the name of the neighborhood, but that one's a bit rougher. But generally, no. All right, I think I see a, a train down there. Hey, oh, Rick says the, the, the queen, is she, someone's saying that she passed away? Oh no, I hope not, well, let's see. Michelle says, come home. Michelle, do you want more New York City content from me? Is there any more that I can add to New York? So many people cover New York now. All right, let me go down to the train. This is a marginal road, don't you say? Kay says no, she's still alive. Okay, let's go. Wow, the society of paleontology, humane paleontology, not a society, institute. Rick says all the royal family is going to Balmoro to be with her. Oh, well, I hope she's okay. I hope she uh, pulls through, but it's good that she's surrounded by family. That's what's most important. Wow, England is going to be, oh. Wow. What do they do when they hire a, not hire, uh, when a new person takes the crown? Let me know. Should I be going to England? Is this the chance? I'm not sure. Alright, who wants to join me over at the 
train. Maybe we can see something cool on the train. It's one of those elevated train tracks. Uh, maybe there's some cool views. So let me know. Let's go. Oh, a place to rent bikes. <laughs> Renee says, I don't know if anyone will celebrate the coronation of King Charles. Sunset says, oh yeah, I was there for the Jubilee in June. Yeah, they're saying that in the event where, and I hope this is not the case right now, but in the event when the Queen does pass away, they're saying that that televised and uh, TV deals are already set up in that eventuality. They estimate that 70, no, I forgot how much they estimated, but they estimated that upwards of a billion people would watch that news broadcast. So there's TV deals with American broadcasting in Britain, I assume in many parts of Europe. Oh, we're close to the, to the catacombs at this point, wow. I really walked a lot. Cool Daddy says, what leisure activities do you do? Go to the bars, disco clubs? I'm not too much of a fan of going night uh, to nightlife. On occasion, I might go with friends on a date, but I generally don't go to nightlife. Uh, so for leisure, I edit short videos for TikTok and Facebook. I research the history of these cities and the culture. I wander around so I can learn about the city. I also do emails. I edit photos. Oh, you mean for leisure, <laughs> not for work. <laughs> uh, you know, I do a lot of work. Uh, I go to movies and it. Yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Eating out, going to movies, sitting. Yeah, it's my leisure activities. Susie says, I always picture you clubbing. I'm not sure why. A lot of people have that in impression. Michelle says, I met the queen at her jubilee and she was amazing. Oh, I'm so glad. Alfred says, you really prepare before going live. You have facts. Yeah, drop those facts. NW says, who's your favorite singer, songwriter? I listen, I don't listen to too many. Uh, Regina Spector is amazing. Feist, it's probably one of my favorite ones. Feist, check her out. Okay, Google, play one, two, three, four by Feist. Alexa, play one, two, three, four by Feist. Alex says, is this your last stop before flying back? Yeah, my last stop. Last tango in Paris, you can say. Camilla says, I used to listen to her a while back. Oh, I'm so cool. Glad to hear that.
Wendy says it's actually playing. Oh, I'm glad it's working. Miss Fancy says, will you come back to Europe? You know, BBC has not called me up yet, so I have to go back to New York. Uh, my visa is coming soon to a close. So I have to go back to New York, unfortunately. I could do, I could travel to another place, but I also have to kind of regain my budget again. Um, but yeah, BBC hasn't called me up to host a TV show. So I've been unable to continue my travels and do more live videos until BBC actually hires me to do a show that sponsors my visa. Gary says, you'll be looking forward to wearing that Harris Tweed jacket for the fall. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, Gary. Do you believe in psychic abilities or intuition? Says Michelle. Psychic, I'm not sure. Uh, intuition, yes. Intuition, I think, is very important. There are things that your conscious mind may not be able to articulate or notice, but you subconsciously or unconsciously notice things, pick up on them. And that is what people may call intuition, a feeling, gut instinct. Many words. What is this? Is Gare Montparnasse? Okay, I think. Oh no, this is Gare Australitz. Ah. What are those gray containers? Trash. These are trash bins. Alright, let's go to Australitz. NW says, is my touchdown on your list? Oh, yes. Yolanda says, I actually like this song. Uh, she's playing it, the, your, your Amazon machine. That's cool. Almo says, did I miss the snack portion? You know, I'm very tempted to share a snack. But I haven't seen anything, anything that has compelled me as of yet. Hey, Sasha says, congrats to the BBC job. That's huge. No, no, no. <laughs> Sasha, uh, I'm, I said that they haven't called me up yet. <laughs> cool Daddy says, are you extroverted or introverted? I'm an introverted extrovert. I'm an extroverted introvert. I'm ambivert. <laughs> I'm pretty extroverted. Um, yeah, I'm pretty extroverted. <laughs> Sasha says, oh, I see they haven't finalized the details. No, no, uh, Sasha. There's n BBC has not called me up at all. There's no nothing. BBC, I have, ne have not had any communication with the BBC. Uh, so, so no, nothing. There's nothing. <laughs> but hopefully they will at some point. Renee says Sky TV pays better anyway. Okay. I, I'm sure they are, but I, uh, I would love to have the prestige of hosting at least one show BBC. Veronica says, pretty busy where you're at. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty busy. We're on a major boulevard. I'm going to show you a, a train ride to some other part of Paris. It's about to rain soon, so whew. Sasha says, your fans are rooting for BBC or Netflix? Yeah, we'll work for both, ideally. That would be amazing. Gary says, didn't BBC Scotland get back to you? No, no. Visit Scotland is the only one who's reached out, but nothing happened. 
which is the Tourism Board of Scotland. All right, let me not actually go to the train station. Let me go to the metro. So this is the Gare de Australets right over here. Okay, I'll show, also catch the RER. Uh, I'm gonna go directly into this metro stop. And this is the five and 10, okay, that's good. That's good. Let me just double check where I'm going. Okay, now I know where I'm going. Cool. Wow. How the hell? I, I feel like I've been walking for a while, but look at this. I started around here and basically we just either did a huge like walk all around. So we just did a massive circle around the neighborhood. It just feels like I've been walking for a while. Look at that, wow. So we haven't really left the area. We just did like a huge circle around the, the station. Sasha says, I fly into Paris tonight. Oh, Sasha, enjoy your Paris uh, trip. All right, join me for a ride on the train. I'm going to be a little bit silent. Um, as I mentioned, one of the negative stereotypes with Americans is that they speak very loud. <laughs> but beyond that, it's also people want to respect the peace of the train. So I'm going to be silent until we get out. So we're getting close to rush hour time. Things are about to get hectic. Hopefully we, we don't get too much of a packed train. It's only a few stops. NW says, have you watched Midnight in Paris? It's one of my favorite films. Uh, so yeah, I love it. Great film. Daddy is asking great questions. Uh, I think this is the terminus for the number 10. So that's why it's empty. Uh, it will get packed soon. So Cool Daddy asks, do you make friends in every, tra every time you travel? Not every place, but I have made friends. Uh, it's especially easy to make friends if you do food tours, uh, sometimes day trips as well. Uh, you'll meet people who are also travelers or uh, tourists and uh, it's very easy to make friends in that case. Otherwise, um, I don't go out to bars too much. Uh, you can make friends, it depends on the country. You can make friends if you're sitting at a bar. France, if you don't know the language, not so much. That is easier in Ireland and a bit easy in Mexico City, if you know Spanish. So it really does depend on the country. Easy in Britain too. I uh, haven't done it too much, but yeah, you can make friends. Ah. 
Well, like I said, the seats look hard on the bottom. They are, yeah. Very flat.
might be a little bit faster in New York, but there's no air conditioning, unfortunately. Veronica sent 500 stars. Thank you so much, Veronica, for the 500 stars. This was the train we boarded. These trains are old. They remind me a lot of roller coasters or like uh, the trains we would have in theme parks. And there is no air conditioning, just open windows. Someone said, is there better service because they're close to the ground? So a lot of these older train lines, like the number one, which we're taking right, no, we took the number 10. The number 10 are they are built in a form called cut and cover. So what they did was basically explore the street, build a huge trench on the street, only about one to two levels down, and then, um, and then put the train line and then covered the street. Sometimes the street would just be slightly more elevated than it used to be. That was the form that they built the subway system. The London Underground was not that way. London Underground, a lot, a lot of it. So there were some cut and cover parts, but a lot of it was deeply tunneled. New York, on the other hand, you might think, oh, we don't have cell phone reception because uh, these subways are very deep. They're not. New York is not deep like London. Most of New York was built under cut and cover. So while the very old line where they're very close to street level, like the number six, has some cell phone reception. Generally, they don't. And I'm not sure what... London doesn't have cell phone reception. I'm not sure what France did. And I visited another city with cell phone reception, the subway, Boston as well. I'm not sure what these cities did to have cell phone reception. If any engineers of, of cell phone or, or any type of engineers tuning in, do let us know. I'm very curious. Because New York now wants to add cell phone reception into its subway tunnels. And they're saying it's going to take a whopping 10 years. 10 years to get cell phone reception in New York City subway tunnels. While France, Boston, and a few other cities, Washington, D.C., already have cell phone reception full underground. Boggles my mind. I'm not sure why it'll take 10 years. And the subway system in New York is big, but at least in Manhattan shouldn't take 10 years. Come on, guys. 
So here we're at the Odeon. Odeon is a really cool area because there's a lot of movie theaters here. Uh, hence the name as well, Odeon. Pablo says red tape. Yeah, I'm not sure. Is it the cost? I'm not sure what. why New York is going to take that obscene amount of time. Esfiel says the rats own the waves. Yeah, no, maybe. Oh, the classic Parisian cafe. So you'll see how well people are dressed. Let me uh, show you from the other side. So we're still on the same side of Paris. It's just we are right now about four subway stops, four, sorry, metro stops away from the Sorbonne area. Sorbonne is actually only a 15 minute walk away. So here, yeah, you can see how Parisians are really well dressed. Cool Daddy says, uh, how often do you get nostalgic every time traveling? Yeah, I've experienced nostalgia plenty of times. I've experienced nostalgia more for some places than others. I experienced a lot of nostalgia for Ireland, uh, for England, for Scotland. And I want to go back to Mexico City. And pretty much that's it. Uh, Greece was very interesting too. But I, I experienced a whole lot of nostalgia for the UK and Ireland. A lot of it. I feel really at home in those countries. Noah says they also might be figuring out time when they can shut down the tunnels to place watering which is a headache in itself. Yeah, because the New York City subway system is 24 hours. Yeah, yeah, that's a big shame because Paris is not a 24 hour system. Um, other places as well. New York is one of the very few cities that has a true 24 hour subway system, which is a bit of a shame because it makes uh, repairs really hard. Also makes other issues like homelessness, uh, people actually living in the subways difficult to control because it's always open. You might as well give in and come back here to Lexus, okay? I wouldn't live in Ireland, but I would want to spend more time in Ireland, that's for sure. I would live in England, that's for sure. Should I go? Well, this is one of the walkable streets. All right. Almo says, possibly you should consider UK again. It'll be a momentous event. Yeah, oh yeah. Seyan says, it looks like St. Germain. It is, yeah. St. Germain, Orion. All right, let's explore just a little bit more of Orion. If anyone has any last remaining questions, I'll be back live tomorrow and Saturday for a few more places in this beautiful area of France. Jay Fox says, oh my gosh, this is a site for sore eyes. Is the weather cool? Yep, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. But why is this a site for sore eyes? This is one of the more beautiful cities in the world. I... You know, it boggles my mind. Um, 
I'm not sure if Jay Fox meant this, but other people have said this, and I know it's, of course, nothing personal at all, but uh, people out there say that Paris is ugly. It boggles my mind how you can even think that. Um, such a gorgeous city. I'm not sure what people are really expecting from a city. There's not that many world-class cities out there that are, are as beautiful as Paris. And if you want something cleaner, there's only a few handful of cities in Europe alone that are cleaner than Paris. Uh, it is also a very clean city. So it boggles my mind when people say Paris is an uh, uh, ugly place. I have a few people who say that. It's like, wow, and a few vlog travel vloggers out there have, have that opinion. I'm like, wow, how do you think that? <laughs> Oh, uh, oh, Jay says uh, you meant uh, to say it's beautiful. Okay, thank you, Jay, for clarifying. But yeah, um, my point still stands. Ah, here we have more of the Sorbonne. I can't walk in this area. It's locked off, but there's more of the Sorbonne. Sorbonne is a huge campus, gigantic campus. Wow, beautiful campus. Let me know of any famous people who graduated from the Sorbonne. There, there's a long list. Let me know if anyone knows anyone from the top of their head. As Phil says, our perception of places are often colored by our experiences in them. Yeah, unfortunately, people have had negative experiences in a city like Paris or New York. So here's one of the many theaters. This is a huge theater district or a cinema district. I love it. I got to come to one of these movie theaters. Uh, the thing is, they play a lot of art house films where I don't know, they, they are not in English. They play them in the original language. But it's art house films, independent films that are not in English. And the subtitles that obviously they're going to have is French. So if I see a film in many of these theaters, I have no idea what's being said. I have to just guess. This happened to me once. So everyone, I would recommend seeing this film called Victoria. Uh, it's a German film, filmed I think in Berlin. And... I end up seeing it without any subtitles because I couldn't find a copy with subtitles or dubbed. I would not watch it dubbed. And the film is mostly in German. And that film was a blast seeing it, having no clue what is being said. The entire film is shot in one single take. No cuts and no cheat cuts like in Birdman or other films where they uh, make it seem like it's one take. They cheat cut. Uh, they did no cheat cuts there. They literally filmed the entire two-hour thriller in one single take. Uh, it was really well rehearsed. They tried it three times. Third time was a charm. But it's mostly in German. And the cool thing is the main character actually doesn't know German. I think she's either French or she's from another country nearby. She doesn't know German. So the entire film, the main character is actually very confused as to what the other characters are saying. And things get really hectic and out of hand. So it was really cool to see the film not knowing any language because I really felt like I was in the character's shoes. I didn't know what was being said. So I would recommend seeing that film, but no subtitles. If you know German, it, will, you, it won't work for, for you. Or if you know French, but if you don't know either, it will really work. Wow, that bus had uh, tram noises on it. I wonder why. Giovanni says, do you know the name of the movie? Victoria, Victoria. There's a few name movies called Victoria, but I think this one was from 2015, I think. Victoria. Mika says, sorry, I've been working. I have to rewatch. Oh, no worries, Mika. Thank you so much for saying hello. 
Another thing you'll see a lot in Paris is these gigantic bookstores. They're truly massive. Right here. Truly massive bookstores. Mostly in French, of course. There are some English bookstores, they tend to be smaller. Here we have the Museum of Cluny. But no, not George Cluny. These are ancient Roman baths. Yep. And the rest was converted into a museum. Really cool museum. Really unique. Highly recommend going in there because you can actually visit intact ancient Roman baths. And we'll end here. Show you from the outside. Maureen says, I pray for the Queen's health. Me too. I hope she's okay. Everyone, give a round of hearts uh, for the Queen. Give a round of hearts for the Queen. May she feel better. Um, she's been a wonderful woman. Uh, she's also, you know, has lived a very long life, which is great. And she has seemed to be very kind to her nation the United Kingdom. So, round of hearts for Queen Elizabeth II. May she feel better. Um, or may she at least be very close with family, surrounded by people she loves. Hopefully, both of those are the case. This is the Museum of George Clooney. Cool Daddy says, do you prefer home-cooked food or uh, food outside? Cool Daddy's asking great questions. Thank you so much, Cool Daddy. Um, I prefer food that's cooked with love. With love. I think cook, a food that's cooked with love, it could be literally anything. It could be homemade Cheetos. <laughs> it could be a greasy, grease-dripping hamburger with layers of melted cheese done in a very uh, grease-soaked bun. You can have the greasiest meal. If it's done with love, uh, I think it's a great meal, ultimately. And I think it'll ultimately go down well. So that's the number one type of meal. If I'm making my own meal, I'll, I'm going to do it with love. So I'm going to make something great with love. But obviously, I'm a bit busy. I don't have time to cook all the time. Cooking is time intensive. I don't think everyone should expect themselves or anyone else to be cooking all the time. It is very time intensive. Uh, even if you're doing simple meals, still time intensive. You gotta wash dishes, you gotta do a bunch of things. Some people make time for it, other people don't. I don't blame for either. I enjoy cooking, but I don't like spending too much time all the time on it. So I do it sometimes. And if I have someone cooking for me and they're doing it really out of the pleasure of their heart. Oh, that always makes a great meal. And so when I go out to eat, I'd rather go out to places where it feels like the food is made with love. If it isn't, I tend to not go to those places. And how can you tell? You can tell by A, meeting the people who actually make the food, me, uh, knowing the owners, meeting the owners, uh, the cook, the chefs, yeah. Another way is to see if it's a place that does its food with pride. Generally, it's very good food. They have generally good reviews. Uh, you can find a lot of those places in major cities all around the world, especially in Europe and America. Um, and definitely if you go to a place where the owner is the person cooking, that's one you'll know it's a good place to go to as a customer. Uh, that is not so prevalent in, the U in major cities in the U.S. It's a bit more prevalent 
in major cities in Europe. Well, you'll find the chef or the cook is the owner, or the owner is right there with the chef that they are very close with, and it's a small operation. Those type of places are amazing. They might be a little bit harder to find in some places than, than others, but once you find them, keep going to them. So I think, I think one of the best things about long-term travel is to keep going to the same place over and over and over again. Sometimes it's very tempting as a foodie, as someone who just enjoys the fine dining, and not fine dining, but going out to eat and enjoying a variety of different things. I think don't underestimate the power of going to the same place a few times during your trip because to get to know the owner or the cook or the chef or the waiter and kind of get to know them, see the smile of their faces, uh, learn about the food that they make, it's a really deeply rewarding experience. And this also applies to coffee, to coffee as well, or to pastries and bakeries and to caterers. So it applies to a few things or to a shop that you go and buy groceries. If you do that, go return to the same place, I think it'll be a very rewarding experience. That's one way to meet people, uh, especially with a language barrier. It's a good way to meet people. You get to meet people if you keep going to the same place over and over again. Uh, it happened to me in Nice. I went to this amazing trater of Lebanese food uh, run by a family. I went there three times. By the third time I got there, I actually ended up meeting the entire family. It was really cool. And they gave me like good pro tips about finding Lebanese food in Paris. So that's my pro tip. Sale de Cluny. Avalon says, uh, I should see movies like, like Water for Chocolate. I've well, never heard of that one. And Big Night. I never heard of that one either. That's interesting. Thank you so much, Avalon. Eleanor says, uh, your glasses look like they're squashing on the side of your head. It is a fact of glasses. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't feel painful, but it's a fact of glasses that they uh, are tight around your temples. Cross over here. Wow. Guadalupe says, I appreciate your, your, your opinions on restaurants and food. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, Joey says, check out the Roman ruins. That's all we can see from the outside. Otherwise, I would have to go inside. And if you are a patron of Super Urbanist, I have an exclusive video of the Museum of Cluny from back in 2019. So I might dig that up and repost it for people to see. But yeah, I have gone inside the Museum of Cluny before. So if you are a patron, patreon.com slash urbanist, you get access to all the live, all the extra videos I've done through all the years. Sometimes they're a little bit harder to find. Um, so it's easier on Patreon. But I'm going to work on making a directory so people can see all the bonus videos in one place. So patreon.com slash urbanist. Thank you everyone so much for tuning in. This was an amazing journey, uh, basically around the Sorbonne. We're still, we, Sorbonne is still right here. Uh, this is the Odeon area, lots of great movie theaters. I might explore one a little bit later, see how it feels going to a tiny little theater. There's a few of them that are a hundred years old here. And uh, there's good food around here as well. So I do recommend it. See you tomorrow at 3 p.m. French time, 9 a.m. New York City time, and then Saturday as well, 3 p.m. French time, 9 a.m. New York City time for the last two final scheduled episodes of Europe 2022. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you everyone so much for tuning in, and thank you to all the patrons, and thank you uh, to Nicole and Susan for sending very generous uh, PayPal contributions as well. Everyone, keep being awesome, and always keep on exploring. Have a great day, everyone. And Raphael says, no, thank you. <laughs> All right. All right, Raphael. <laughs>
<laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for thank you saying thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> My pleasure. Have a great day, everyone. Au revoir, mes amis.